I am so excited for today's guest because this is someone who has been in the game a long time too. He started a podcast after me, probably five years after me, and that podcast took off. And you'll see why. If you followed it all, the number one real estate show. You're listening to The Real Well Show with Kathy Fetke, the real estate investor's resource. Hello and welcome to The Real Well Show. I'm Kathy Fetke. And if you're watching the YouTube version of this, you'll see I am not in my studio. I am in a hotel. Actually, the San Francisco airport, we just had our live event. It was so awesome to see so many of our original members at Real Wealth. We had uh, people that have been members since 2009. I know there were a couple. There were a couple from maybe even 2007. So, uh, oh, almost 20 years that, um, that people have been a part of our organization and we've been through so much together. These people were involved when we were buying new homes, when prices were going up so dramatically, uh, but we were buying them in Texas, so we stayed out of the storm. Then when the rest of the country just came crashing down as far as their real estate values, uh, these people helped me uh, go into the neighborhoods that have been the worst affected and buy the busload. We would, we would go as investors and buy up those homes, fix them up, and restore those foreclosed neighborhoods. Uh, and then, of course... You know, the run up in real estate over the last 10 years and finding those markets all around the country where uh, they were like on hyper growth so people could get in front of that path of progress. So anyway, it was just really fun to see so many of our members who have been with us for so much of this journey. And of course, meeting some new people too. We had, oh, so many new members. About half the room was full of new members. So anyway, I'm still in San Francisco because uh, as you'll hear, I flew from San Francisco to Denver to the Better Life Conference, then back to San Francisco for the money show. It's been a busy week, but I am so excited for today's guest because this is someone who has been in the game a long time too. He started a podcast after me, probably five years after me, and that podcast took off. And you'll see why. If you followed it all, the number one real estate show podcast, it is the Bigger Pockets podcast. And with me today is the one and only Brandon Turner. Oh my goodness, I am so excited to have the one, the only Brandon Turner here on the Real Well Show. So good to see you. Welcome, Brandon. Thank you, Kathy. You're one of my favorite humans on the entire planet. So this is such a oh. treat. I, I love this. Wow. That is so sweet. Thank you. We just got to hang out with you and your suite after the Better Life party. Yeah, I'm going to call fun. it. It's a conference, but yeah. it's a, more of a party. Uh, what you guys That's had, why like... we all go to conferences, right? We just want to party <laughs> with our friends. And so, oh, it was a, it was a good time. I'm glad, I'm glad you guys came. Thank you again. I mean, people absolutely love you guys and love what you have to say. So, oh, um, thank yeah, you. Love it. Well, believe it or not, there might be a couple of my listeners who don't know who you are. So um, who are you, Brandon Turner? <laughs> yeah. yeah. So so I'm a real estate investor, first and foremost. I love real – I'm such a nerd with real estate. I absolutely love it. I bought my first house when I was like 20. Didn't know what I was doing. Uh, I was just trying to avoid law school because that's like the path that was kind of like set for me. Uh, and I, I bought a property and I made a little bit of money and I thought maybe I could turn this into a career. So I just kept buying properties for no and low money down because I was broke and I uh, just kept doing that. Uh, you know, got to 30, 40 units, kind of got stuck there for a long time in this little bottleneck and then eventually broadened up to some larger multifamily. And then I got into the big stuff. And so today through my company, Open Door Capital, we're at 13,000 units and uh, Continuing to grow about a billion dollars of real estate. I wrote some real estate books. They sell really well. Uh, they were through Bigger Pockets, and Bigger Pockets is massive force of of people. So I've sold a million plus books, and uh, I was on the Bigger Pockets podcast for a decade, which was oh, just such that. a great <laughs> decade. Yeah, just that. A couple, you know, whatever, hundred million downloads there. So I've been around the internet world of real estate investing, but uh, always excited to chat with uh, with people who have not heard of me. So that's great. Well, and it's funny because I remember you saying, now, when did you start the Bigger Pockets podcast? And which is the biggest real estate podcast? Yes. It was, it's big. Uh, when was it? It must have been uh, 2012, I think. I think and it was didn't they tell you it was too late to start a podcast? Yeah, it was yeah. too Actually, late to I, the game? 
I told myself it was too late. I remember saying the words like, hey, podcasting had its time and now it's dead. But you know what? Let's just get the tail end of that kind of uh, that wave, not realizing that that was just the start. It's like surfing, right? Sometimes you're out there on the wave and you're like, ah, oh, it's not going to be a very big wave. I'm not going to try. And then it just becomes this monster wave. And you're like, dang it, I should have tried for it. I should have gone for it. Uh, I'm glad I went for it because it, that little wave was actually a, uh, a pretty massive tsunami. Well, I, I want to say I was on that same wave, but mine was smaller. So I don't... <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. you know, Bigger Pockets had a had something special there in the beginning. We had a massive email list to begin with, so we weren't exactly starting at zero. We had a we had a little bit of force behind it. Yes, it's huge. Well, it's been really fun to watch you uh, just take off and soar. So using that same metaphor of, uh, you know, sometimes not like you think you missed it. It's too late. Yeah. Everybody's doing it. Who am I to be one of the the, yep. the many trying? Um, how does that apply to today in the real estate market? Mm. I hear that all the time. Oh, it's too late. It's Such too late. <laughs> a good question. Yeah, I love that. I love that. That's a perfect metaphor. It's like, yeah, people, first of all, I love that waves comes in sets, right? A wave comes in a set. It's like you get a bunch of waves and then it kind of calms down for a little bit and then it comes in a set again. And so the people in the real estate market today who are saying, oh, we already missed it. You know, oh, the best time to buy was 2019, 2020. It was really good deals then. Now it's too hard with interest rates. It's like, hey, just the waves changed a little bit. You got to adapt to how the waves are and you got to maybe surf a little bit different way. But the surefire way to not get any waves is to paddle in and just go sit on the beach, right? But you stay out there and you will find a way to make it work. Just because the market's changed doesn't mean it doesn't work. It's just how it works has changed pretty significantly. So yeah, it's like one of my favorite quotes actually says like, you know, you can't control the waves, but you can learn to surf. And so you can't control the market, but you can learn to ride it. Uh, and, and so you just got to keep asking that question, what's working now? And that's why podcasts like this are so phenomenal because you get to listen to people like you're interviewing people about what's working for them. So now listeners can go like, oh, okay, well, that's, that's the surfing technique today. I guess I'm going to try that one instead. I'm going to do a long board instead of a short board. I'm going to do, you know, whatever this thing instead of this thing. It's, it's all good. It always works. It's just, you gotta, you gotta figure out how to surf, right? Yeah, I would say the, the how do you find out if someone is not a real estate investor? They're telling you they can't buy anything. You know, they're telling yeah. you the market's bad or whatever. They're blaming it on yeah. something else. Everyone yeah. I know who's experienced is just like all in all the time, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you always figure it out. And you know, that here here's some advice for people that are listening that maybe look back and go, "Oh man, back in 2012 and 13 and 14 there were deals everywhere. They were so cheap." And it would have been so easy to buy them. But what we all kind of just forget is how incredibly difficult money was back then. Like you could not raise money hardly at all. It was so hard. It was so hard to find banks that would do anything for you. Like back in 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, like it was just impossible it felt like. And yet there were deals. And so like there's always going to be a hard. Something's always going to be hard. And if you're always waiting for the hard to go away – you're never going to buy any deals because all of a sudden today, if the market, you know, if interest rates drop, it'd be like, oh, good. Now it's easy. No, it's not. If interest rates drop, every homeowner in America that's been holding back is going to go buy. So now it's going to be competitive again. Oh, now it's going to be hard again. So it's always hard. You have to learn to invest with that as a prerequisite. It's going to be hard. And there's always a looming recession. <laughs> yes, there's always, right? A broken clock is right twice a day, right? So it's like, there's always, people have been claiming recession and something's, it's, of course it's going to happen. Uh, but that doesn't mean you should stop. You just, you keep moving forward. You look at the market, you look around, you're out there on the waves, you're looking around. Where's the next set coming from? Is that a good one? Oh, how's the weather? And you're going to surf just fine. I love yeah. that metaphor. We should write a book, Kathy. That's oh, yeah. Surfing into real estate. Right Surfing into real estate. Yes, I love it. Let's do it. <laughs> oh, my goodness. So fun. Okay, well, what are you – so that bringing it to the now, what's the wave you're looking for or you're, you're getting mm. – you're, you're ready to paddle for? Yeah, Great question. A uh, few things that really excite me right now. You know, we've been doing mobile home parks for years, I, for the last five years, and I love mobile home parks. I continue to love mobile home parks, even though it's hard. It's very hard. It's competitive. Um, there's a lot of headwinds against mobile home parks, but I still like them. So we're still looking at that. The reason I like them is because it's a solution to a massive problem, right? Money's made in solutions to massive problems. Or a way to look at that, Wayne Gretzky says uh, something like, I'm not successful because I, I'm successful because I skate to where the puck is going not 
to where the puck is. So he's looking ahead the same way that when we go out, you know, paddle boarding, looking for whales, you don't paddle to where you see the whale spout. You paddle like a mile in front of it. So then the whale catches up to you, right? So we want to get ahead of trends. We want to get ahead of problems. So low income housing in America, affordable housing is a massive whale that I want to get in front of. Mobile home parks are a good way to do that. Uh, I love self storage. I'm I'm loving that still. Uh, I we recently got into like hard money loans or private credit that we're doing as kind of a mix in our fund. I'm excited about that. I love things like rent by the room, assisted living, sober living. I think those have a massive uh, potential because they solve really big problems. Uh, build to rent. I think there's really interesting things going on in that world. And I still love single family houses. I don't think we should count out single family houses. I think there's still good deals to be found across the country. So um, I'm, I'm still a big fan of that too. Oh, I'm glad to hear that because I do get excited about a good single family. <laughs> I me really too. do. I, yeah. I don't know why. It's just like, uh, it's just fun. Like our whole thing has been to get, an, again, using the metaphor, ahead of the wave. So yep. being able to buy like a lovely home, create a family for somebody and just watch that grow so much in value without having to really do anything. It's kind of not the hard. It's the easy way in yep. my opinion. If it's, I agree. If it's yep. a good quality property. Totally um, you know, so my obsession, as you know, is like finding those little hot spots where there's growth. But yeah, good. I'm glad to hear. Sometimes I feel like, oh, it's just like so rudimentary, you know, we're not. Uh, yeah, yeah, like, yeah. I've always no, thought. I think, yeah. <laughs> I think that there's a reason that all the giant hedge funds in America, there's so many of them are buying single family houses. I mean, these are Harvard, Yale, Stanford, MBAs, like the smartest people on our planet are buying single family houses right now still by the thousands. So there's something magic in single family houses and I believe there always will be. Yeah. Oh, I love that. All right. Okay. So let's go back to just over the years you have interviewed. Do you even know how many people? I mm. mean, I mean, just, just <laughs> yeah, last weekend. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Hundreds, hundreds, maybe five, five, six, seven hundred people. I don't know. It's been a lot. Yeah, yeah. Including you, just, you a few times. Yes. And and uh, we were just with 750 of your closest friends at your last uh, last event. So it you really just, was. <laughs> <laughs> you know so many people. You've heard so many stories. Over the years, what would you say – this is such a hard question, but I'm sure you know the mm. answer. If you were to just to boil it down, the themes, the things, the themes that stood mm. out the most to you. Five words. I think it's five words. Success is never a surprise. And I, I say that because every successful person I've ever known in real estate is never surprised that they got there, right? Like it's, it's like, it's almost like if you found somebody who had a six pack and you're like, wow, look at you, like how lucky you are. Like they would just get ticked off. They're like, I've been at the gym every day for the last 12 years and I, I don't eat, you know, like I've worked <laughs> with this. Don't insult me by saying that I got lucky with a six pack, right? The same thing is true with real estate. Like Success is never a surprise. It's a system. It's a process. It's work. It's time, but it's not a surprise. And that should be the best news in the world because it means anybody can get it. It means that there's a process to get that over time that will deliver the results. It, it's, it's shocking. It's like you could take any successful real estate investor today, bankrupt them, start them brand new. And within a couple of years, they're going to be financially free again. Because it is not luck, it is not happenstance or right place, right time. It's simply several key systems and processes. You just work and the results come true. Just like diet and exercise make you in shape, analyzing deals, getting leads, off, making offers, negotiating, you know, finding unique niches and strategies, it delivers financial freedom. Oh my gosh. I love that so much. Yeah. Yeah. It's perfect. It's a, we also have a saying like your employees should never be su surprised if they get fired. Right. They should yeah. have, oh, they should right. know, right. <laughs> that that's yeah. coming. Yeah. And I've, I've heard, I've heard, yeah, your employee should never be, uh, somebody said that once they're like, you shouldn't be surprised if an uh, so employee shouldn't be surprised if they get fired and you shouldn't be surprised if they quit. It's like, you should know your employees good enough to know that they're struggling or whatever. Yeah. I, I yeah, love that, that concept. Thing. But that's, oh, that's so cool. Okay. So out of that then, that it's like, we do know what it takes to have great abs, harder to do. We know what yeah. to do. It's hard to do. Yep. So how would you apply that to real estate? Like what, what has been the key factor for you? I mean, you listened to all these people, you learned from them, yeah. you took it and you went with it and look at you. So yeah. yeah what are those? Yeah. Key metrics. 
Yeah, so ancient, like, you know, uh, Greek philosophers like Aristotle and Plato, they had a term for this, and they call it acrasia or acrasia. I'm not sure. It's spelled like acrasia, but it's probably said acrasia. Anyway, the concept is like, we know what we should do, yet we don't do it. I mean, it's even like there's a Bible verse in the Bible where Paul, like, who's like the most famous saint in the Christian church, who's like, what I want to do, I don't do it. And what I don't want to do, I keep doing. Like, what's wrong with me? <laughs> it's like, we all have that feeling, right? Like you could be the best saint in the world. And you still have this problem of, I know what to do. I know I need to analyze deals or go to meetups, take people out to lunch. I don't do it. That's acrasia. So how do we overcome acrasia? It's really like my like mission in life. And the way I look at it, there's, there's lots of answers, but I'll give you four or five. Uh, number one, I'm a big believer in hiring other people to do the most important tasks. Because if you're a visionary entrepreneur like Kathy, you and I are, like we are not good at necessarily sitting down and just checking boxes and doing the work, right? Like I just, I'll do it like twice and I'm like, all right, well, I analyzed the deal. Now I really want to go on a walk and I'm going to go hang out with my kids and I'm going to go read a book. And But an employee is usually pretty good at doing the tasks. So if you can outsource it to an employee, outsource it to an employee, make their job dependent on it and they'll get it done and manage them right. Uh, number two, I would say track your goals and habits. I mean, set goals, define your habits, and then track them. If you're doing that, like let's say your goal was to buy a rental property in the next 12 months. Cool. Uh, what are you doing every single day that gets you closer to that? Maybe your habit is I'm going to analyze three deals every day. I'm going to make two offers a week. Great. Are you actually doing that? Tracking it can help you overcome that acrasia and actually do it. Uh, number three, accountability massive accountability. The more you can do, I mean, I have friends who do crazy stuff like, oh, I guess I've done it too. But like, Hey, if I don't get this right, I'm gonna have to wear a dress to dinner. Or if I, I'm going to make five offers this week. And if I don't, I'm going to have to lose my phone for a month, like stuff like that, like extreme accountability with your buddies or with a small accountability pod makes you so much more effective because now there's somebody else holding you to the standard that you define for yourself. So that's been huge getting around other people, just being in a tribe, being in a community, being in a group of people who are that believe in you. And they also have that like abundant mindset. And so when you say, Hey, I'm going to go buy a rental property. They're not looking at you like, no, you're not, you know, like that's dumb. Don't waste your money. That's risky, wrong community to be a part of. So get yourself around some people that are elevating. Uh, and you do all that stuff. Uh, y it's natural. You're going to succeed better than if you were to just do just, you know, go through life, like in the backseat of a taxi, just hoping that you land somewhere good, like get in the front seat, drive a little bit. I, that is so important. All of those things make all the difference. You've got to s surround yourself with people doing what you want to do. All right. So what would you say looking back are things you wish you could tell your younger self, things you might've done differently? Ooh. Yeah. Great question. You know, a few things I'd probably go back and tell my younger self. Number one uh, is don't be afraid of commas and zeros. In other words, like my friend Darren Sager says that all the time. Don't be afraid of commas and zeros. It's like bigger deals are not that much more scary than smaller deals. In other words, I'd buy a house that was $40,000. That was cool uh, because $400,000 scared me. But you know what? Over the last 10 years, prices have doubled. 400000 went to 800000 and 40000 went to 80000 Had I bought the bigger deals... I would have made way more money. Now, I'm not saying I'm going to go buy deals that don't make sense, but the, the truth was I was afraid of bigger deals because they had too many commas and zeros. And so number one, not to be afraid of that. Number two, I would have read more business books uh, instead of just real estate books because real estate, shockingly, is business. The better you are at business in general, the better you're going to be at real estate. Uh, and that really leads to number three, which is I would have made it a team sport much earlier. Right? I, I was playing a single sport. I was playing tennis by myself, you know, against the blank wall, like versus like <laughs> basketball, we have different people doing different things. I want to, I want to be in a team sport. Uh, and, and it's way more fun. It's way more profitable. It's less work. Everything's more fun and better when you have a team sport. So that, that's what I'd tell myself if I was uh, going to do it again. Yeah. Yeah. And when your younger self is really like just a few years ago, cause you're still young. Um, and you, yeah. you are playing that, um, Team sport, because when you mentioned all the different asset classes that you're interested in, you know, you 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 met, you listed off a whole bunch of things. Well, normally someone would say, whoa, stay in your lane, right? Sure. Brandon, stay in your lane. But you built a team. So, yeah. you know, here I am developing. I started partnering with a developer when I was, uh, it was a developer with 40 years experience. There's no way I could have had that because I, yeah. I would have been five starting, you know, when... Yep. When, uh, when I met him. So building a team, Love tell that. me about that. I'm assuming you have built a team of specialists who do those things. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. Very much built a team. I mean, you know, back in the day, again, I would do everything myself and that's how I built my business. And maybe then eventually I'd outsource a couple small things. Like I hired my mother-in-law to answer phones for my tenants and, you know, things like that. I'd hire a plumber to fix a toilet because I got tired of dealing with toilets. But overall, it was mainly a, you know, a me sport. But when I built Open Door Capital, I wanted to do it different. I, and I thought of it more like an engine. If you think of a company as like an engine, right? One piece moves this way, which makes this piece move this way, which fills up this little gear that moves that way, right? So people work together, this system, this machine. So I said, well, what if I just design the machine from the outside looking in? And what if I built the machine to not necessarily have me at the, the, the main machine? Like, I'm not even in the machine. I mean, I do some stuff in the company, but like, I, I got an acquisitions person who's incredible at it and loves to do it and loves to have phone calls with investors. I hate that. I don't want to do that. <laughs> this guy's like favorite part of his day is we can get on a phone call with an investor relation, like with an investor. So it's like good for him. My uh, uh, underwriter. Like his, his favorite thing in the world is to sit in front of a spreadsheet and work numbers on a rental property. That's not my favorite thing in the world. I don't mind looking over the numbers, but I don't want to spend four hours underwriting, but he loves it. So you get the right people who are like built for that task and they get a lot of joy and value out of it. And you get the right team together. Now I get to be the, the head coach. So I get to, to be on the sidelines a lot of times and I'm looking at the play. I'm watching how they're doing things. I'm, I'm saying, Hey, you're, you know, you're holding the ball too long. You're hogging over here. I'm building, I'm, I'm, managing from like the kind of the side or outside looking into the system. And that's been so helpful in building companies. I wish I would have been told that early on. I I love the way you describe that. Some of the mistakes I've made in the past is not knowing if they were, how do I say it? Like as a head coach, you need to know the skill level of the people you're bringing in. Like, how did you figure that out? Yeah. And and I'll continue the metaphor of like a basketball coach on the sidelines. It's like, you can look at people and say, Hey, in college, that person played really well. I'm, I'm scouting them. I see them. I poach them or I take them from another industry where they're doing really good. And I put them into my world. But then just like the, the, just like basketball, you have the preseason, you have ways to test it out and try it out before you actually get your thing. So we do that all, we do internships. I do partnerships. I do one-off deals with people. Uh, we built pretty much all of our company off of the kind of that, that building, because at the end of the day, resumes almost worthless, uh, past performance, almost worthless, right? Like just cause somebody was good over there. doesn't mean they're going to, it can indicate they're going to be good, but it doesn't guarantee it. I need to see how they work and I need to work with them. So we try to find as many ways as possible to work with people first, uh, and then just like a coach, if somebody's not playing well, you, you remove them. You have to be able to move people around constantly uh, to get your team uh, to where you want it to be. I love that, testing people out. We just did this with our new syndication manager. I, we had a 1,000 applicants for that job. Wow. And I was like, how am I going to sift through these? So I just gave them all a really difficult assignment. I gave them yeah. a project to underwrite that I knew kind of wasn't one I would do. And, you know, some were just all over the place. Some just didn't do it. Uh, and then one guy came back and it was so, so, so orderly that it's like, okay, this mm. is the guy. Love it. He put a lot of time and detail into it. Yeah, yeah test you know, him <laughs> before. Yeah, yeah, we do We do something. We call it the gauntlet. It's like the, the idea of like running the gauntlet and getting hit by people while you're running down this long path. It's like we do the gauntlet. So it's a series of tests just like that. So it's like, uh, uh, interesting enough, we'll get, yeah, we'll get hundreds of applicants for a, for a, for a job applicant, uh, a, a job offer or whatever. And the first test is usually, Hey, just shoot a video of yourself, just selfie style video explaining who you are and why you want the job. Half the people never fill out that do the video. Okay. So they're Mm. gone. And then it's like, all right, the next test, just whatever do it's usually a fairly simple thing. Half the people won't do that one. And so they're gone. And so it's like, we can whittle people down and then the final 10, I mean, it gets pretty hardcore. Yeah. Like you got to do harder and harder stuff. And at the end of the day, we might have three applicants who are just, they've proven themselves over five or six, seven tests. And some applicants get mad after that and they don't get the job and they get, they send like these really mean emails, you know, that are Aww. like, how can you make me do so much work and then not get the job? And I'm like, first of all, it was a few hours of work. Let's not go overboard. <laughs> Second of all, Google, if you go, if you want to get a job at Google or at Apple or at Amazon, I guarantee you, you're going to do a dozen, dozen interviews with a dozen managers and they're going to make you fly across the country for the interview. So like, you know, welcome to modern, like good business. Like it (laughs) it is what it is. Yeah. Yeah. And and also it's like, well, good riddance. I'm glad I didn't hire that person. (laughs) (laughs) 
Okay, finally, we are out of time, but I want to just talk about better life because you're doing sure. some, it's not just about the money, right? Of course, we all want to live a wealth of real, yeah. a, a life of real wealth. Of course, we want that. But you you have an even bigger mission and purpose. So let's talk about uh, what you're doing over sure. there. Sure. Yeah. So, I mean, the idea came to me, actually, I was on top of a mountain over at the Broadmoor Hotel in California, uh, in Colorado. And I was at this mastermind there. And I'm talking with a buddy about, you know, how I was going to build this, you know, real estate mastermind. And I love real estate masterminds. I was going to build one and I was literally shopping for a private jet. There was a private jet dealer that was at this <laughs> event. And I'm sitting down with this woman. We're shopping for what private jet I'm going to buy because I knew I was going to launch this new mastermind. And I knew it was going to be su- successful because... I'm just an ambitious guy and I, I, I'm a visionary. So I could see the, what was coming. And I knew I had a lot of people that followed me on Instagram and in, in YouTube and all that. So I'm shopping for the private jet. Uh, and then that night I heard Tim Tebow speak. Uh, he came in and talked, the football player, Tim Tebow. And he was talking about just the horrors of human trafficking. And it broke me. I mean, uh, yeah, it broke. Like I was just, I was crying and I was like, everybody was crying in that room. And we ended up raising like 2 million bucks that night out of like 50 people in that room. We raised like $2 million. Wow. It might've been three. It was a lot. Uh, to, you know, to help him and to support what he's doing. And so that night I changed my whole mind and it, it was just like, I, I'm already wealthy. Like I already have real wealth. So do I, do I need a nicer, you know, a house? I mean, I already have a stupid nice house. Do I need a, a big jet right now? Could I get that over time with my real estate? You know, there's more things important than just getting the nicer car and the nicer jet. So anyway, I decided to pivot the whole thing and we still built it. Uh, but the better I tribe is a hundred percent of all profits go to charity. I don't even take a salary. I think I get a dollar a year and, uh, I'm just really, really believe that when, if I can get thousands of real estate investors, active investors involved with setting goals, with tracking their habits, with accountability, we have these extreme accountability pods. If they can do that stuff, they're going to succeed in life. They're going to rip the ripple effect. Well, they're going to give more money to charity in the future as they build wealth. Uh, and then all of our profits get to go to the fight right now. So uh, I'm just super passionate about it. And it's a mountain I can never fully climb. Like I'll never get tired of helping people. I mean, I yeah. can get tired of building wealth, but I'll never get tired of helping people. So Especially I'm going to keep doing the- that. The weakest of the weak. And, Especially, yeah, yeah the mo- what, what Tim Tebow calls the most vulnerable people, the MVPs. Yeah. It's like, yeah, they need a voice. And if we can help with the money side of that, I'm going to keep doing it. Yeah, love it. Okay, and I think just at uh, last weekend's event, you raised uh, 140000 for another another cause. Yeah, yeah. So really. Yeah, for Steve's I, uh, Live Like Jet. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I want, I want. Yeah, thank you guys, get, by the way. You donated uh, and brought in a lot of that money. So thank you. That was so sweet. We weren't even there. And I, got, I think we got auctioned off for, I don't know, 20 grand or something. Yeah, it was, <laughs> it was a good like, chunk of money. Somebody's going to spend spend a day with you guys. So yeah, it was super cool. It was really cool and really exciting and actually got me really inspired and I want to talk to you about that. I, I now have a mission to buy my sister a house. Um, no way. I love that. Well, she's in the San Francisco Bay Area, so I, I buy houses all the time, but not there. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. That's a, um, that's a little different. Yeah, she's just Very been cool. um, you know, struggling with cancer for 20 years, and I just want Ooh. her to live in a lovely place. So I am uh, – I am. that's my new mission. I'm going to talk to you about how to – how, how to how to make that happen. All right. Well, Brandon Turner, yeah. it's always a pleasure, always a pleasure to talk to you. Can't wait to see you again somewhere, whether it's at a Maui Mastermind you're doing or your next Better Life or wherever. Yep. Can't wait. You too, Kathy. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for joining me here on The Real Wealth Show. If you want to find out more about how to get those sexy houses in those fastest growing markets, uh, just go to realwealthshow.com. You can meet with one of our investment counselors for free. All of our investment counselors invest through our network. They also speak with hundreds of members. We have uh, over 73,000 members now, uh, and they're speaking with so many people to find out which markets are really performing the best, which teams have the best ratings, and they can share that information with you. We have a couple of brand new areas uh, that we're super excited about. One's in Tennessee, one's in Alabama, and we're vetting a few more. So we've got uh, two new people on board, actually a husband and wife, Rebecca and Grant, I've had them on the show, who got an RV, sold their house in Indiana, got an RV, and they're just traveling around the country finding great teams for real wealth. Um, that includes property management, um, acquisition teams, repair teams to make sure that 
you are taken care of if you're investing out of state in some of these growing markets. Again, that's realwealthshow.com. Thanks again for joining me. I'm Kathy Fedke, and we'll see you next time. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are provided for informational purposes only and should not be construed as an offer to buy or sell any securities or to make or consider any investment or course of action. For more information, go to realwealthshow.com.